story about a young man who, uh, who got saved and he was eager to grow in his Christian life. So he decided one day to get a piece of paper and make a list of all the things that he was going to do for God. He got really excited about it and, and he was eager to, do, to, to spring into this new life in Christ. As he began to write down things that he would give up, places he would go to minister in areas uh, of ministry he would like to enter. He was, he was just ecstatic because of what God had done in his life. So he went home and and after he got done with this list, he brought it to church. And during the church's invitation time, he, he brought that list up there and he laid it down on the altar. And he thought he would feel some joy in his heart, but instead he kind of felt a little bit empty. He didn't understand why. So he so he went back home the, that night and he, and he began to work on his list some more, adding more things that he would do and, and would do, so to say. And, of course, he made even a longer list that the next Sunday he would... He lay down on the altar again, but still felt nothing. Well, he went to a, to a wise old pastor uh, that was pastoring the church at the time, and he told him of the situation. He said, you know, I don't understand. Why, uh, why don't I have more peace and joy about, about this? Well, the pastor told him this. He said, take a blank sheet of paper, sign your name at the bottom, and then put it on the altar. In other words, give, me a, give God a blank check, so to say. Well, the young man did that. He said, he finally got the peace he was looking for. But you got to admire somebody who's got a heart like that. You know, he's got a heart that just, whatever, God, I just want to live for you. Whatever, God, I just want to please you. Whatever, God, I just want to make a difference for you. You know, today as we're continuing our Grounded and Growing series, we have to ask ourselves sometimes, what kind of heart do I have for God? Honestly. I mean, let's not lie to ourselves. Let's, let's just be honest. Do I have a heart for God? You know, much of our spiritual growth and our commitment to growing will be determined how much of a heart we actually have for Him. Everything we do and, and don't do will resonate from those motives that are within our inner heart. Years ago, God was looking for a king to reign over His people, Israel. And in our text, the Apostle Paul is in the middle of one of his messages, if you will, but uh, is rehearsing that fact or that, that situation way back when in, in uh, Israel's history and mentions something about that person he chooses by the name of David. And notice what it says about his heart. It says here in Acts 13, verse 21, After they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. I'd like to focus a bit on David here today, because David, according to the Scriptures, was a man after God's own heart. He had a heart for God. What about us today? Do we have a heart for God? Do we have that kind of heart that uh, was like David's and just wanted to please God with every ounce of his being? And tonight, we'll or this morning, I should say, we'll talk about this as we talk about growing a heart for God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts and lives, and we pray that our hearts would grow closer to you here today. I pray, Lord God, that, that uh, our motives would be pure, that our, our desire would be only you, and what as a result, I pray that our relationship with you would, would be enriched and strengthened, but also that our fruit here on earth would uh, abound as well from that enriched and strengthened heart for thee. We ask now your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when it comes to our relationship between us and God, the heart really significantly matters. You know, you can dress right, dress, you can act right, you can, you can go the right place and do all the right things, but sometimes it's even, it, it can be for all the wrong motives. Uh, the heart might not be in the right spot. Only you and God know that, but uh, God certainly does know where our hearts really are at. You know, again, when God was searching for a king, you know, they had Saul for a while, for 40 years, and Saul was a dud. 
Saul was a man after his own heart. <laughs> he was a self-seeking man. He was a selfish man. He's, he sought for the glory and the comfort of me, and not for the betterment of God's people, nor for the glory of God. He disobeyed God on a number of occasions and uh, was, a, was a pitiful example of a leader. Well, God, uh, before Saul was all done with his reign, it said, I'm going to remove him and his, and his house from being king, and I'm going to find out a person after my own heart. And, of course, if you know the story, he told the prophet Samuel this, and he said, go to Bethlehem, and go to this man by the name of Jesse. And he's got sons there, and amongst his sons, I have prepared me a basically a king. So he goes there, and, and he finds Jesse and his sons, and, and uh, he has Jesse bring out all his sons, or at least so he thought. And as, as uh, Samuel began to look at his son, he saw the oldest, and the second oldest, and the third oldest, and and they look the part. They seem to be manly. They seem to have a good head on their shoulders. I'm sure they were buff. I'm sure they were everything that a good king is supposed to look like. Maybe said even some of the right words. But God said, I haven't chosen any of these. Of course, they go through that sequence again. And, and, and Samuel's just kind of scratching his head like, what's going on? I mean, this guy certainly has got to be the anointed. But God tells Samuel something very, very important. And it's a very good truth to understand. First, or First Samuel 16, 7, he says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. That is a critical truth God's people need to understand. That God is looking at your heart more than he is looking at anything else. And your heart plays a big role in, uh, in your relationship with him. David, of course, was presented before Saul or Samuel finally. And of course, God anointed him. Though David seemed like a very unlikely choice. He was the youngest. He, he didn't seem like you know he was a shepherd boy, so to say. He, he, he wasn't skilled, maybe, in, in some of the things his older brothers were. But God saw the heart of David versus the hearts of his brothers here. And saw that this boy's heart was purely motivated to please him. And God eventually, over the course of time, brought him to that position of being king. Later on, after long after David reigned and after his death, he was it was as you read the, the Old Testament kings of the stories of the kings, David was often the one that every king was measured up to. In fact, it mentions in 1 Kings 15, 5, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, with one exception, say only the matter of your eye, the Hittite. But that was the heart of David. You know, talk about nobody being perfect, but boy, he did a quite a job. Why? Because his heart was in the right spot. You know, God didn't have to arm wrestle him to do right. David wanted to right because he loved God with every ounce of his being. Yeah, he made a big mistake. He did. In, in, uh, in, in that uh, situation with that adulterous affair with, uh, with Bathsheba and, and, uh, and uh, having Uriah killed, basically. And it cost David. But you know what? Even despite that great failure, God later it still records here in Acts 13 that he was a man of the Bible. But even during that time where, where David was, I guess you would call backslidden, had done wrong, he wanted eventually to get his heart right. In fact, Psalm 51 talks about that. We won't look at the whole psalm, but what he desired to create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God, he longed to get right. You know, there were other kings that did foolishly, but they, they kicked against God when they were caught. When David was caught, he just humbled and broke. Yeah, he reaped some bad things, but you know what? He still loved God with all his heart. God picked him up and moved him on. And David, as you read through his life, and as you read the Psalms, you know that he loved God with every ounce of his being. Of course, as we see here, God even still references that years later in the New Testament record. Say, so why is the heart so important to God? Why does that make such a difference? You know, a lot of religion today is all about outward appearance. The outward things that you do, and certainly there is a there is a appropriate spot for the 
for the outward to be right. But the outward should be a reflection of what's going on on the inside, not peer pressure put on by the outside. And uh, the, you can continue to put peer pressure on people, but eventually they're gonna, the real them is going to come out. But with God, God wants the outward to reflect what's going on on the inside. And often it does, if it's done right. See, the heart itself is the seat of our will. It's our emotions. It's who we are. It's the decision maker, if you will. And our real motives come from within our hearts, don't they? Not necessarily what we say, but what's going on inside. As people, we can hide our real motives from others. And that's certainly, uh, some are very good at that. <laughs> you would never know the, the true motives of their heart by the things they say, the, the things that they do, and so forth. You know, we can put on a show and there are people that certainly do it and say the right things. And we can't even look the right way, but God knows the truth of our inward hearts because nothing is hidden before God. Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Again, we can hide everything from man. We can, we can put on a good face. We can say the right words. But God's looking right into our hearts and seeing, what is the truth here? I see the truth, regardless of nobody else does. And God's looking at our hearts each and every day to see where we really stand with Him, what our real desires are. You know, God desires that we give Him our hearts fully, that we have a heart like David did, a heart for God. In fact, Proverbs 23, 26 mentions, My son, give me thine heart, let my, thine eyes observe my ways. Can I ask you a question today? Have you personally, as an individual, given God your heart? Have you really, truly given God your heart? That's a personal choice. You know, nobody can make that for you. Honestly, it's it's a decision that we that we all have to to make in life. Is you know, is my do I want to give God my heart? Now some choose to, like David did. Boy, God used David in a great way, didn't he? David experienced a lot of tremendous things as a result of that. Some choose not to, and I wish I wish there was more that that we're choosing to than choosing not to. But too many of God's precious people sometimes are making some choices that is because it reflects that they just don't have a heart for God. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying, you know, in some cases, that's just the truth. I guess you have to determine yourself if that's you or not. But hopefully it's not. Now, some will fake it, of course, but some, some are certainly genuine. I can tell you this much, the truth always comes out eventually, no matter how long we've been, quote, faking it. <laughs> I've seen that, I've been saved long enough, coming up about here on 16 years and just about less than a month. I've seen a lot of people over the years, and I've seen a lot of people who appear to be one way, and you would never know it. And then one day it's like this, the, the reality came out, the real heart showed itself. And they're gone away from God like you would never believe. You know, how's your, where's your heart at today? I believe a growing, maturing, healthy, spiritual Christian is one who's developing, and other words, growing a heart for God. It'll be a heart that desires to pursue Him. It'll be a heart that desires to please Him. It'll be a heart that desires to promote Him. And today we're going to look at those three things. And uh, take a little test ourselves. Let God speak to you. If there's maybe an area that maybe we're not, we don't have a heart. I guess that'll be between you and God. First off, let's talk about growing a heart for God in the sense of pursuing Him, to pursue Him. Now, the Bible calls David, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 1, the sweet psalmist of Israel. It says here, now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was, who was raised up on high and the anointed of the God of Jacob, and notice the sweet psalmist of Israel. 
Of course, I think many of us know here that David was the, one of the primary authors of the Psalms. He didn't write all of them, but he wrote a good majority of them. And the Psalms themselves were written, uh, were songs that were written that often demonstrated the various things David was experiencing throughout his life. You can read a psalm in there that talks about the time when he ran from Absalom. You can, talk, you can read the psalms in there that talk about how he was running from Saul and when he got victory over, over the running from Saul and, and all these different things that were going on in David's heart. The, the psalms really expound some of those types of things to us. I think that's why we find them so comforting because they, they, they kind of relate to the things that we experience on a day-to-day on a -day basis or week-to-week -week basis. He, he had that kind of heart. God allowed us to, to look into this man's heart a little bit through these psalms and get us help us understand uh, that uh, what he's experiencing and uh, particularly his inward thoughts on matters that he was experiencing. You know, Psalm 27, 8, here's an example. It says, When thou uh, said, Seek thee my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. In this verse, David is communicating, really, that he had a heart to seek and pursue God. And God said to him, Seek my face. Notice what his heart says back. Lord, I'll seek your face. I, I will seek thy face, O Lord, will I seek? That's a man that's saying, God, you're, you're important enough to me where I can, I'm going to spend time with you. You're important enough for me to pursue. It was something that drove David's inner being. I mean, this was what the true reality was in his heart. He, this isn't a guy who was putting on a show. This was a guy that was truly devoted to his inner core. To God. Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2 says, this is, I, I put the first part on there so you know it's a psalm of David. It says, when he was in the wilderness of Judah, he said, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no, God, no water is. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. This was David's heart. I mean, he's not about a thirst for God, a desire to know his creator in a very intimate way. You know, I grew up in a religion that you didn't know God in an intimate way. You just did some rituals, and you went through some steps, and you got, you got certain things done to you, and you just went through a weekly ritual of repetition and so forth. And God wasn't that personal to me until I got saved. And then he became a lot more personal to me. And I began to understand what, a little bit of what David means here. By saying, I've got a desire to know God. And, and those of you who have been saved here, I trust that you have a desire to know God. David's heart developed as a result of taking time to pursue God. It's a lot like you know when people start seeing each other, we might call it courtship or whatever. What do they do? Well, the whole point is they're pursuing, it. in the guy's case, the lady's heart. And he, he's getting to know her, and she's getting to know him. He, they're getting to know their likes. They're getting to know their dislikes. By the way, at those times, it doesn't matter if, if they don't agree on things. They just say, oh, I just been sorry I didn't love, right? And they like to know how, how a person reacts. They, they just want to get to know everything about the individual. You know what? That's the way we should pursue God. That's the kind of mentality. That's the way David did. David was a busy man. Now he was leading the kingdom. Over a few million people. Huge army. <coughs> large treasury. <laughs> you know, he, had, he had a lot on his plate. He had a big family too, by the way. Lots of boys and, uh, and some girls in there. He was a busy man. Yeah, he, he was going through some big trials in his life at times. But you know what? I think what I read through the Psalms and through his life, David made time to make sure he pursued God. God was number one. If everything else takes a back seat, that's fine. I'm going to make God number one in my day. There's another, there's another spot where he talks about uh, going before, before the Lord three times a day and so forth in the Psalms. I'm just saying, he made God number one, the number one 
pursuit of his life. There are other Christians in the Bible that, that will have that same kind of mentality. I think the Apostle Paul did too. He wrote in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. That I may know him. That, that was Paul's desire. He pursued God. We still talk about St. Paul today. Good night. We have a, have a capital named after it, after him. God used Paul, but Paul pursued God. Even Jesus Christ, with his busy schedule, made sure that he pursued his Father. Luke 5, verses 15 through 16, he says, But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and notice great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him him of their infirmities, and notice, despite all that, he withdrew himself into the wilderness of pride. He spent time with his father. Can I ask us a question here today? Is the pursuit of God a top priority on our list? Is it a, is it a big priority? Or is just Sunday morning something you check off and then that's the rest, of, that, 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 that's all there is? Now, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Maybe you're doing better if somebody doesn't go, but, but it should be greater than that, really. It's designed to be better than that. Is it a top priority? You know, God knows the truth, and we do too. <laughs> We've got to be honest with ourselves. If we want to grow, if we want to have that heart, we've got to come to, come to understand, do I really desire to pursue God with all my heart? Or is it something I kind of take or leave or, or allow everything else in this life to... God? Are we faithful in the house of God when the doors are open? Do we walk daily with Him in prayer? I, every, every, absolutely every day. Are you in God's Word? Reading and meditating. I appreciate what you had to say at 9.30. Reading and, and getting that Word of God ingrained into our hearts and lives. Are we spending time getting to know our God? Well, I've read through my Bible, Pastor. Well, that's great. But it takes more than just reading it through once. It's a daily dosage. You know, you can read a passage a hundred times. I'll guarantee you on the hundred first time, you'll see something you didn't see the other hundred times. God's Word is living, and God's Word will speak to your heart at certain junctures in your life when you need it the most. And will instruct you. You'll see things you never saw before. As you stay, as you stay close to him, you know this book is not exhaustible. And regardless if you read through it once, twice, three times, four times, twenty times, you're still going to get something out of it, and you're still going to need to be in it. So I just don't have that kind of time. Well, David didn't either. <laughs> neither did Paul. Neither did Jesus. They didn't. They made a choice though. They made a choice. They want a heart for God. It's like, okay, if I'm going to have a heart for God, I've got to pursue Him. I've got to pursue Him. You know, what we make a priority in life comes out in action, right? What's a priority in our life will come out in action in some regards. Our actions will always often reflect our hearts. God tells us through David in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 7 and 11, it's a psalm that's recorded in, uh, in the Chronicles here. It says, Then on the day David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. And this was on one of the lines. Seek the Lord in his strength. Or to seek his face periodically. Every once in a while. Once a year. Christmas and Easter. Every other month. As long as it's not time change Sunday. <laughs> That's what God wants out of us. If we want a heart for God, He'll start by taking time. Is that, a, is that a priority for each one of us here today? Or is it kind of, well, I hope it's not at all. Jesus bled and died for you. Jesus cares about you. Jesus gives you life and breath every single day. God has given you a job. God has provided for you. It's the very least that we can do with this Amen? Number two, we please him. We please him. 
According to what God tells us, David's heart was fully committed to the Lord. If we're here in Acts, it says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who what? Which shall fulfill all my will. God speaks of David being a man who was willing to fulfill whatever God's will was in his life. Of course, fulfilling the will of God is something that very much pleases God. Because it reflects a heart that trusts and obeys Him and understands that God's way is the best way. That His way is perfect. And it's a heart that's willing to walk by faith. You know, the Bible mentions in Hebrews 11, 6, but without those faith, it's impossible to please Him. Please Him. Great God must believe that He is and that He is rewarded than that diligently seek. Do you have a heart that desires to please Him? Please Him with everything that you do. Jesus had that kind of heart. I like this in John 8, 29. And He said, And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things, notice, that please Him. That please Him. Paul called out his uh, apprentice, if you will, his disciple Timothy, to maintain that kind of heart as well. He mentions in 2 Timothy 2. Four. He says, no man that war hath entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may notice please him, who had chosen him to be a soldier. Are we pleasing God? A person who is growing a heart for God desires to please God with every area of their life. That ought to be their driving goal. How can I please my father? How can I make him happy today? How can I have a, a just cause him joy and, and and, and be happy, you know. As a father, right now, I got, uh, occasionally my son will bring down his schoolwork to me, and, and uh, he's, he's been working on writing in, their, in his, uh, in his uh, schooling. They, they, they started on cursive, <laughs> of all things. And uh, I've watched him improve in that. He'll come and he'll show it to me because he wants to please me in the sense of, hey, Dad, I've done a good job. And I was like, yeah, you know, we'll cheer, have, have a good time, and everything like that. But I appreciate it when my kids want to please me. You know, I, I think all of you here that have children would say the same thing. Of course, there's times they don't please you, but there's times that they do. And it, it, it's such a joy and it's such a blessing when our children are like that. You know, how much more God's children do God when they when we please Him? And that ought to be a driving goal. You know, I, I don't believe God is pleased when Christians develop a heart that says, I'm just going to try to get by doing the bare minimum. I'm going to just try to see what I can get away with. I'm just going to do this or do that because inwardly I'm seeking my own personal glory. That doesn't please God at all. I think it kind of hurts God's feelings a little bit. God, again, is, is looking at our motives and saying, you know, why are you doing this? Why, why, why are you doing this? What, what, what's the purpose behind this? Again, why do we do what we do? I, I don't care. Whatever spectrum of life you want to talk about, why do you and I do what we do? Is it a heart that wants to please the Lord? Or is it a heart that just wants to be convenient for self? And to exalt self? And to make self comfortable? And to make self glory? And to bring heap praise upon self? I think we've all got a problem or we need to kind of push that stuff out, don't we? It comes, it comes very naturally to us all, myself included. But we've got to strive to desire to please Him more. You know, why do I involve myself in things that I do? Why do I wear what I wear as far as clothing? Why do I talk the way I talk? Why do I go to the places I go? Why do I watch what I watch? Why do I listen to certain things and not others? Is the motive... Behind that, I want to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord. Because that's ought to be the reason why we do anything. Or don't do certain things too. I just want to please God. That's all. Just a humble, that's it. That's all I want. Or are there things that we know that God would not be pleased about if we knew? Boy, man. He does know, right? <laughs> There's nothing that's hidden. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 3, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Uh, I don't have that one in there. Let's let's go to Proverbs 15. I apologize for that. Well, actually, 
in this one. There we go. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. The evil and the good. God sees it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Again, we can hide things from the pastor. We can hide things from the church people. We can hide things from our relatives. We can hide things from anybody. But we don't hide anything from God. <laughs> we just don't. Because God sees it all. And a heart that is developing for God is desirous of doing things with a pure motive of just wanting to please Him. Because we love Him. You know, if I can come up to you today, I'm not going to do this, so don't worry. I'm not going to put anybody in this spot. But would, would it be very easy for you to say, if I ask you, do you love God, would you say, yes, I, I love God? Would you say that, I love God with all my heart? I mean, if it honestly happened. So we'll all be nervous in front of people. Let's just say you didn't have that nervousness, and just to be truthful. Would you honestly say that? That I, I love God, I want to please Him with everyone else in my people. Is that the kind of heart that we have? You know, a heart that is developing for God, again, is desirous of doing things with a pure motive of just wanting to love Him. Even when it comes to our service for God, it, it shouldn't be something that's done out of pure guilt. I know people that, that, that it's out of guilt, or maybe because they've got leadership guilt in them, or something. It, that ought not be our reason why we do it. Always, because it's an obligation, you know, God commands it. Well, that's not really the desire God wants to see. But it ought to just be out of that. I just want to please God. I want to please God by what I'm doing. And when our hearts reflect that desire, I believe God is pleased. Why? Because He sees the sincerity. He sees that this person does it because He loves me. And that brings God a lot of joy. By the way, when we do things that please God, proper actions and decisions, and all those things, I, I, all those questions, just seem to fall into place. Say, I don't know if I should do such and such. Ask yourself, would this please the Lord? And it's, uh, if it makes you something, well, I'm not sure. Well, probably a good thing you don't do it. Should I wear this? Well, does it please the Lord? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Well, there's your answer. Uh, uh, should I go to this place? Well, would it please the Lord? Would you feel comfortable that Jesus was right next to you? By the way, He is. <laughs> he is right next to you. Well, I don't know. Well, there's your answer. Should I watch this? I don't know. Do you think, would you feel comfortable with Jesus sitting there next to you? I don't know. <laughs> Christian life is pretty easy. You know, we, we do things to please the Lord, not because the church, quote unquote, sets all these rules. It's out of, it ought to be because I want to please my Father. I want to be like Christ. And you know what? When we have that motive, everything just seems to fall into place really nicely. You don't have to arm wrestle people. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, get them uh, excited about witnessing and serving and giving and so forth. Why? Because when you have a heart for God, it doesn't matter. You just want to please Him with everything you, you can. That's, that ought to be what we desire. The question is, do we actually desire that? Is that our goal as individuals to please our God? Is there areas God is showing us we are not that maybe need to be corrected? Not smoothed over, corrected. Psalm 139, another psalm by David, verse 23. Look at this prayer. Would we pray something like this? Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. David was saying, God, check my heart out. See if it's, if it's in the right spot. See if there's a blind spot. Help me to see uh, where I'm wrong, so I can do right. Is that our heart's desire? Is that our, 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 our desire? Today as people, or is it kind of well, not really? I'd rather just do something a little comfortable. I don't lose the Lord. Our churches need people like this. You know, our country would turn around in a heartbeat if every church in America had people that wanted to please God instead of looking for places that just entertains the flesh. I'm telling you something. There'd be a transformation. There'd be a revival like you wouldn't believe. There really would be. But we need people that, that, that desire that. That want to make a difference for Christ. Want to glorify them with every ounce of their being. Make a difference. Really would. Number three, and finally, we have a heart to promote. A heart to promote. 
Throughout scripture, God labels certain people with certain titles that often reflect what you might call their above average or exceptional character traits. Abraham himself was called the friend of God. Moses, at his time, was called the meekest man alive. And this is all recorded in scripture. God, in the book of Jeremiah, named out five individuals, Noah, Job, Daniel, Moses, and Samuel, uh, without getting into background detail of it, as exceptionally godly men. It's fitting that the man after God's own heart would be one who is also a musician, David. And I believe through his music, amongst other things, but we see it a lot in the Psalms, that David promoted God. Because you tend to sing about the things that you love. Isn't it interesting that people sing about blues, drunk, drunkenness, uh, uh, adultery, and uh, and all these other types of things, killing cops and so forth? I guess you know what they really love, right? People sing about what they love. Sometimes at home we'll, we'll take some songs, maybe a hymn or something we sing here in church, and we'll, we'll put our kids' names in there and, and kind of change up the words and just have the tune and so forth. And we kind of have a fun time with that. Say, so why do you do that? Because we love our kids. We'll kind of do that every once in a while. And, uh, or we got some tune or, or whatever. We'll, we'll just sing some silly things and they laugh and so forth. You know, you, you tend to sing about things that you love. In fact, God rejoices over his own with singing. Why? Because he loves us. Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee. Notice, singing. What are God's voice sounds like? That would be interesting to listen to him sing. Right on the pitch, right? Incredible. <coughs> it was through song that David promoted or spoke about God. Psalm 22 and 22 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. There's several verses like this. We don't have time. I was going to take us to Psalm 145. You read that whole psalm. Psalm 145. It talks about David declaring God's greatness and goodness amongst people. You know, the Bible says in, one, in another psalm that let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I would say that David had no problem uh, in regards to bragging and promoting and speaking about, however you want to put it, about his God. I don't think he was doing it in a pious, hyper-spiritual, snooty declaration. I believe it just joyfully flowed out of him like water. That he had just this, I, this, this love to promote him. Just talk about him. He talked about, uh, about uh, God. He sung about him. I believe he... He wasn't afraid to speak about God. You know, we have so many Christians that don't want to speak about God. We're going into the closets. We're going into the closets and nothing wrong. Well, if I say something, you know, I might get in trouble. <laughs> Let me tell you something. An eye roll, a rubber hand is nothing compared to what some people pay for declaring the name of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something right now. Don't be lost their lives. You're not going to lose your life in this country, most likely. I'll tell you, we need to be willing to speak for him. I'm not saying being rude and obnoxious, but with a tender heart, please not talk to somebody about their soul. You know, you've been saved here today. When was the last time you personally witnessed to somebody? Personally told somebody how you got saved, how God wants to save them. Well, that's a pastor's job. That's more than a pastor's job. That's every Christian's duty. Declare that his name is, is for every person. We ought to be people that promote it. But when we have a heart for God, it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard to want to tell others about him. Tell others how they can be saved. Tell others uh, about uh, what it takes to, to know God in a more intimate manner. When a people have a heart for God, honestly, it just comes out. It comes out. There's that desire there. And your heart is full of God. You know, what? what's really in our heart will come out under the right circumstances, by the way, too. If we've been putting the good stuff in there, the good stuff will come out when the bad things happen. If we've been putting the junk in the heart, the bad things will come out when the, when the bad things happen. You know, Paul... The Apostle Paul was also a man 
who had a heart filled with God. And you notice in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you ashamed of your, uh, of your God? I hope not tonight. I hope not. It says, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth in the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of it. Paul paid a price for it. I said, I'm not ashamed of it. I, I, I'm proud to declare that I trust in the God of heaven. You know, somebody asks you, if you stand on certain issues that contradict the word of God, are you going to say, yeah, no, I, I stand with God. If you stand with God today on, on the things that God matter to God, Paul did. He said, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Are you ashamed of him today? I hope not. I hope you want to promote him every way that you possibly can. 2 Timothy 1, 2, again, he writes, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul was not ashamed. He loved God, and he promoted him. You know, we, we should never be afraid of what people say or think. We should not become closet Christians, and there's too much of that today. Too much of just trying to, to save self. Trying to, trying to uh, protect self. You know, God's your protection. God will take care of you. God says, the fear of man bringeth the snail. We've got to, if we have a heart for God, we're going to desire, I want to get his word out. I want to get his name out. I want people to know how good he's been to me. Again, not in a pious way, but in a way that, that shows that, hey, look, I love God, and I want to do what's right. We ought to be like the apostles. I like this. Acts 4.20. For we cannot but speak the things which you have seen and heard. Wow, what a powerful testimony of what God did in their lives. But they could, and Paul could, and of course David could do all these things because they grew a heart for God. They developed a heart that wanted to please Him, that wanted to pursue Him. And of course, ultimately, they would promote Him. Is that something we're developing? Is that something we are growing? When God desires our hearts, let me encourage you today, you've not given God your heart to give it to Him today. Maybe you need to be saved, you've never given Him your heart and salvation. God has called out to you and said, you're lost, you're on the road to hell, but I've come to save you. I've come to forgive you of your sin. If you just turn to me with all your heart, trust my Son alone to be your atonement. You can be saved and get that heart right with me. And maybe today you are born again, Christian, you have been saved, but trying to live for self a little too much. Maybe some things have gotten in the way between you and God. You know, maybe today you need to lay that down at the altar and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to turn back to you. I want to have that pursuit because I want to have that heart. God help us to, to have a heart for Him. Let's stand